All right, good evening, everyone. We are about ready to get started. So please, for those of you in the room, you can uh, grab your cup of coffee and a cookie. For those of you at home, I hope you have cookie and uh, cookies and coffee as well. So we are ready to get started on a very special evening uh, event for part of our homecoming and reunion weekend. Good evening, everyone. My name is Erin Sidrovich, and I'm the Director of Alumni Engagement here at OU. And I'm very happy to have my co-host with me this evening, Kelly Brault, our Director of Annual Giving. And I know I speak for Kelly too when I say how happy I am to be here with all of you tonight for this very special occasion. We get to hear about the history of OU from the people who made it. How great is that? We've got folks in the room that we are looking at here live and in person, and then there are uh, a lot of folks, 46 in fact, who are attending online. So wherever you are joining us tonight, welcome. We are pleased to be sharing this evening with you. As we get settled in, I'd like to take a moment to recognize uh, some of the OU leadership who are in the room physically with us live and in person today, including Mike Westfall, our Vice President of University Advancement, who is here, and also Aura hirsch Peskovitz, our President of Open University. Welcome to you both. In addition, and of course, keeping with tonight's theme, we have some more history makers in the room with us, including several of our former faculty, Harvey Burdick, Joel Russell, uh, Richard Stamps, Joan Rosen, Michael Riley, Bob Gaylor. We're also excited that among our online guests tonight, we have Verinder Moodgill, previous provost at OU and now president of Lawrence Tech University. Welcome, <coughs> Dr. Moodgill. We've got Mary Otto, Brian Murphy, Gerald Grossman, David Bricker, and John Kaulishaw as well, to name a few. Um, we have some other special guests joining us. We have Kathy Stoutenberg, daughter of Herb Stoutenberg, one of the original Oakland folks who came from Michigan State back in the day. And finally, we have Priscilla Hildum with us, a widow of Don Hildum, one of the very early OU faculty who's also joining us. So welcome to all of you, again, who are joining us at home. Thank you so much for being here. We are very, very excited. Quick bit of housekeeping for tonight's event. Uh, after we do our panelist introductions and a few initial questions, we are gonna open it up to Q&A from the audience in the room and at home. If you're joining us in person in our room here at the Oakland Center, you can submit your questions on the note cards at your table. And Sandy Alther from our team is going to be uh, walking about the room. You can just hold your card up and she'll come and get it from you. If you are joining online, you can use the Q&A feature to ask your questions, which is located at the bottom of your screen. We're gonna get through as many as we can. All right, the moment you've all been waiting for. I'm going to ask uh, Fred and uh, Bill and Shelly, they're all here, they are all got cameras on, which is good. So I'm gonna start in with our formal introductions. First up is Bill Canellan. Bill is an alum from the class of 1967 and has held several significant administrative roles at OU, including assistant provost and acting vice president of academic <coughs> affairs. Currently, Bill serves as assistant provost at the University of Florida, where he is joining us today. Welcome, Bill. Thank you so much for being here. Next, I am pleased to introduce Shelley Appleton. Shelley is a former associate provost of OU and a distinguished professor emeritus of political science. And hello, Shelley. And finally, Fred O'Bear is also with us this evening. Fred is a former provost and vice president of academic affairs at OU. And after leaving OU in 1981, he became chancellor of the University of Tennessee Chattanooga and he's joining us from Tennessee tonight. Welcome to you too, Fred. Now, some of you may realize that we're missing a familiar face. Uh, Don O'Dowd was scheduled to join us, but he is unable to participate tonight because of health reasons. However, he is online listening in, and we are so pleased that he's able to join us in that capacity. So certainly uh, welcome, Don, and we uh, are sending all of our best well wishes to you. Uh, we are, though, in very good hands with Shelly, Bill, and Fred this evening, so I'm excited to go ahead and get started. Gentlemen, welcome and good evening to all of you. All right, we're going to jump into some exciting topics right now and then let the stories flow. And I think we're better to start than at the beginning. Matilda Wilson, Woody Varner, John Hanna, 
Imagine those three in one room. Bill, we're gonna start with you. Maybe you could tell us what you remember of the conversation between these three visionary individuals that resulted in the genesis of OU. And we're gonna remind you to unmute yourselves uh, for the panelists. You guys are uh, good to go on that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> The, uh, the genesis of Oakland University um, actually uh, was triggered by the University of Michigan, which wanted to establish a branch campus in Oakland County. Um, and through a variety of people, they approached uh, the Wilsons to see if they would be willing to give some land uh, to launch the place. The Wilsons said, um, we think that's a great idea, but we're Michigan State folks, and so we're going to talk to folks in in East Lansing, um, and they did. And John Hanna, uh, who was president of Michigan State at the time, um, dispatched Woody Varner to come down to uh, Rochester to uh, the Meadowbrook Farms uh, to talk to the Wilsons about donating the land. And he said, oh, and by the way, um, we need to have some money so we can actually start the place, not just have the land. Um, and he said, we think we need about $2 million to get us launched. Um, and uh, Matilda said, well, I, I think we can do that. And Alfred said, um, uh, are, are you sure? Uh, whereupon <laughs> Woody decided that he was going to talk to Matilda only, and Alfred got shunted off to the side. Um, so uh, that's, how it, that's how it happened. Um, Woody was, at the time, he was the vice president at Michigan State. Uh, John Hanna said, um, why didn't you go down to Rochester and be the chancellor at Rochester? And, um, and uh, Woody brought several people with him, including Herb Stoutenberg. Um, and uh, that's how Oakland was launched. Amazing. Great. Um, we're going to ask Fred to start off with this next one. Um, we were originally known as MSU Oakland, and I'm interested in hearing some of your recollections of that short period of our time in history with that. Uh, Fred, can you talk about that and make sure you touch on the battle between John Hanna at MSU and Harlan Hatcher at U of M? Oh, you're going to have to unmute your microphone there, Fred. Yeah. There, you go. there you are. We can hear you now. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, the uh, Harlan Hatcher had, as Bill indicated, had started to uh, develop some branch campuses, one at Dearborn, one at Flint. And his goal, I think, was to surround Michigan State and close it down. And John Hanna was going to have none of that. And, uh, uh, and so the, uh, the Oakland, the MSU connection of Matilda Wilson, I think she served a, part, a little time, maybe an appointed time as a board member at Michigan State. Uh, as Bill said, she was uh, much more interested in having the East Lansing campus develop something in uh, Oakland County. Uh, and, uh, and she moved forward with that. So uh, it's been a, it's been an interesting time to uh, Shelly and I and Don O'Dowd all arrived in the second year. We were not the true hardy pioneers who launched the, the institution in 1959, but we joined the faculty in 1960, uh, in Don's case in the psychology department, and in Shelley's case in political science, and in my case in chemistry. I was the second chemist hired at Oakland, uh, Paul Tombolian was the first. He was an organic chemist, and my uh, concentrations were in physical and inorganic chemistry. And so we kind of complemented each other in that uh, department. Uh, I can remember my interview with Woody Viner uh, uh, when I was still finishing up my graduate work at the University of New Hampshire. Uh, I came out to Oakland for an interview and ended up in Woody's office eventually after meeting a number of other people. 
and uh, he was aware of the fact, I don't know how he knew this, maybe from one of my professors back in New Hampshire, that I had an offer from the State University of New York at Albany to go there and a postdoc offer at Ohio State University. And Woody sold me on Oakland by saying, why would you wanna to go to an established institution and inherit somebody else's mistake? Come here and make your own. And <laughs> it's that I could not resist. So I think a lot of us felt that way. We were in it near the beginning of an exciting educational experiment uh, and uh, uh, it has developed into the wonderful institution that it is today. Well, and I think Shelley's story about Woody um, enticing him to come to Oakland is also worth noting. Go ahead, Shelley. Well, uh, I was a student at the grad student at University of Minnesota, and I took the New York Times on Sundays and uh, one day I saw an article by Lauren Polk about this wonderful school that was developing uh, in Rochester, Michigan. And the thing, because I was becoming a China specialist, the thing that struck me was the, Med the Meadowbrook seminars uh, had said that every student must study a non-Western society. Uh, so I sent a letter to the name to Derwood B. Varner that was in there. Uh, and I said, I think it's wonderful that you are uh, going to require students to study non-Western societies, because I think that's been neglected. Uh, I wasn't looking for a job. I sent off the letter. I forgot about it. Then I got a reply uh, from Mr. Varner saying, well, why don't you come out to our institute, to our place and take a look at it? So I went to my uh, uh, doctoral advisors. I had not had my prelims, never mind the dissertation. Uh, I didn't. I didn't send a resume. I didn't have a resume, <laughs> and uh, spoke to my advisor, and I said, "You don't want to go there. It, it doesn't exist. There's no library. What would you study?" Uh, you stay around here, uh, you'll be here another year or two, and then we'll get you a job at a real university with a library. And I said, well, the man says he'll pay my expenses, so maybe I'll go and take a look. Uh, and they said, okay, but if he makes you an offer, you can't accept it. Uh, and here's what you do. Uh, you ask for this ridiculous salary, you ask for lots of money for the library so you can use your Chinese language materials that you're going to have used for research and blah and blah and, and that he will always allow you to teach in your specialty. So I went there and Bob Hoops ran me around for the day and finally I got to talk to Woody and he said I like you what would it take to get you here. So I said all these ridiculous things that, that I was told and Woody said, okay, <clears throat> and I didn't know what to do. I, I said, can I talk to my wife? Uh, and he said, hey, uh, you made some ridiculous requests here and I didn't negotiate with you. I said, yes, so now you're obliged to, to come here. <laughs> and I said, I need to talk to my wife. <clears throat> And Bob Hoops, who was the dean, was sitting there and he said, I think you need to let the man talk to his wife. <laughs> so Woody said, okay, but call me back in 24 hours. And I said, 48, and he said, done. And that, that, to follow up on that, uh, a couple of years later, uh, Woody went to, the, uh, to three Asian society organizations and asked them to make a list of the best people in the field. One name appeared on all three lists, and that was Charlie Hucker, who was at University of Arizona. And what he said, he was going to go, go get Charlie Hucker. And I said, good luck. <laughs> uh, so uh, after Charlie came here to give away the story, uh, I asked him how he came here, and he said, you know, I don't believe it. 
I'm sitting at my desk in Arizona, and I get some call from some guy who says, we'd like you to come to our campus and blah, and blah. And I said, I'm sorry, I'm very happy where I am. Thank you very much. And Woody said, look, we'll pay your way. What have you got to lose? So I came here uh, to visit. Uh, and then Woody said, what would it take to get you here? And I said, all these absurd things. And he said, yes. <laughs> so that was apparently the way that Woody uh, operated. I, I looked up because of this uh, session, uh, the current equivalent of the salary that I was offered uh, oh, yes, it, and I was supposed to get an assistant professorship, not come as an instructor, which he agreed to also. Uh, that would be about $66,000 in today's oh, cash. Yeah. Uh, a, a fellow China specialist I knew had just accepted uh, an offer about $36,000 from Wayne State University and was very happy with it with an Ivy League degree in hand. So that, that was the way Woody operated. Well, we're grateful for those powers of persuasion that uh, Woody had then, <laughs> absolutely. Well, let's keep on this uh, uh, angle about the, the young, these young high powered faculty members who uh, along with the students in those, those first few years are generally credited with creating that pioneering spirit that we all really reflect so fondly upon today. I mean, alums that I talked to, you know, from, from those uh, early years, uh, that first decade, I mean, that's really important. They were there, they were the pioneers. So, you know, talk to us about that culture and maybe Fred, we can, we can um, uh, push back to you and see what you have to add about that. And certainly the other panelists can, can chime in as well. Fred, do you want to? Um, am I you good now? Yep, you're good. Yep, I am. I'm good. Uh, what I uh, recall was the um, youth of the faculty. I, I mentioned earlier that I joined Paul Tomboli in, in the chemistry department. And I think one of the reasons he supported my appointment was that I was younger than he was, and he was tired of being referred to as the youngest member of the Oakland faculty. Many of us were younger than some of the students in our classes at that time, certainly the veterans who came back uh, to school uh, were more uh, were older and uh, uh, than we were. And I can recall an incident with uh, Shelley in the uh, registrar's office, which was part of the old library before the Presby Library was even built. And we were, uh, we were in line to pick up class lists and Shelley asked for the class list for Political Science 101. And the woman behind the desk said, I'm sorry, we only give those out to faculty. And he said, I am a faculty member. Uh, and I said, I stood behind him and said, same for me, I need the chemistry one and I'm, I'm a faculty member too. So uh, we, were, we were mixed up with the students. The, the issue that that created was that there were literally very few, if any, senior faculty around to help guide us into becoming uh, faculty members at this pioneering institution. Uh, we really uh, didn't have guideposts of that kind. And I think some of the grading crisis, we attracted a lot of valedictorians into the freshman class and quickly flunked them out. Uh, in the, uh, um, the newspapers referred to this as brainy flops uh, many times. And uh, other times uh, the university was referred to as the Harvard of the Midwest and the 1400 acre brain farm. Uh, so we were emphasizing academics over the rest of the trappings of the university. And uh, Woody carried that message forward. Um, no fraternities and sororities, no intercollegiate athletics, certainly not football, no compulsory ROTC. 
and several of us two women said, you know, we ought to start talking about what we are, not what we aren't doing here. Uh, and I can recall uh, his uh, total objection on the athletic side. Uh, and as a faculty member of a branch campus of Michigan State, we uh, enjoyed faculty privileges in East Lansing. We could use that library. Uh, we could get discounted athletic tickets over there. And my wife and I, I recall, went to a MSU U of M football game that first fall we were there after hearing Woody's anti-athletic speech so many times. Uh, Woody and Paula Varner were in the stands, not too far from my wife and me. And he was cheering on the MSU team like you wouldn't believe. And I went over to him at halftime and I said, you know, I get a different story back in Rochester about football, but you seem to be having a pretty good time here this afternoon. And in typical Varner fashion, he looked at me and he said, Fred, he said, we come over here every chance we get to renew our disgust. <laughs> That was, that was a lot of fun for many of the students. Uh, I think Woody said we gave failing grades to 18 high school valedictorians, something yeah. like that. I remember students saying, uh, welcome to Michigan State University, Oakland, the only school from which no one has ever graduated. <laughs> we are inviting you to our alumni reunion and a phone booth in the OC. Uh, so it was, we did not have, we were young kids. We didn't know anything about students like this. We'd had no training in teaching. Uh, the students, there were no juniors. There were no seniors. There was nobody to set the culture. Uh, but us young faculty, and uh, we socialized with them and, and basically set the culture. Uh, uh, my, For my, people like Bill who survived, it was a great experience, I guess. That's, that's exactly right. My freshman year, the fall semester, the overall grade point average for everyone on campus was 1.99. <laughs> that was, and that was grading crisis number two. That wasn't even the first one. Wow, that's oh, so. yeah, I, re I, I recall start stories from some of our early class members and, you know, Bill, you were among them where where the students were told at convocation, look to your left, look to your right. Only one of the three of you is getting to graduation. <laughs> Can you yeah, imagine? Actually, okay. actually, that was that was um, in my class. It was during freshman orientation and it was oh. over in the science building. And it was Woody, it was Woody who said it. He says, Look to the person on your right. One of the two of you won't be here next year, not graduation, next year. And he says, look to your left, yes. same story. And, and sure enough, they were both gone the next year. <laughs> I still yeah. ended up being true. Uh, three, three, years, three years into uh, uh, my tenure at uh, Oakland, Woody called me into his office and asked me if I would reduced my teaching load to part time, half time and become Dean of Freshmen. And I said to him, I'm not familiar with that position. And he said, we don't, we've never had it. It's a new one here. Uh, and I said to him, well, what does the Dean of Freshmen do? And he said, for heaven's sakes, try to make some sophomores for us. We need sophomores. <laughs> Awesome. Uh, so flipping, flipping a little bit from the faculty side of things, uh, we're touching a little bit into students and that kind of thing. Can you talk a little bit about the student life at the time in those early years, um, activism, the res halls, things along those lines? Uh, whoever wants to chime in, uh, feel free to have at it. And I think uh, somebody had mentioned something about Rochester in the early years too, and wanting to talk about that. I think Shelley was talking about that. David Reisman, a distinguished psychologist, visited Oakland. He was writing, uh, we were one of the schools he was writing about. And he said, uh, he had been a U.S. Marine. And he said that Oakland's social life reminded him of Marine boot camp. So uh, 
Mm -hmm. I mean, there wasn't much going on. There really wasn't. <laughs> Pretty intense academic atmosphere, wasn't it? Yeah, it Bill, was what was the social life among the students? Social life among the students was sneaking into the pool uh, at midnight before they even opened Lepley and playing water polo. <laughs> <laughs> There was a lot of talk uh, about some of the student activism and how students expressed their opinions. Um, and, and I wonder if, uh, if you'd want to share any stories. We are past the statute of limitations on most of that, I'm sure. So, um, uh, but uh, what are some of the things that you all recall in the way that the students express their, you know, um, their feelings for the issues of the days? Some of the things that students said have stayed with me over all these decades. Uh, one, uh, Charlie Hucker in his class was teaching uh, about reincarnation in connection with Buddhism. And a student, I, I may be wrong, I remember the name of Mary Jo Pagano, uh, mm -hmm. said, well, the population of people is increasing. So does that mean that the population of bugs and animals is increasing? <laughs> and uh, we thought that was a great question. It was a great topic at our lunches. Uh, another time, uh, I think 1968, uh, an African-American student, I was just in passing, uh, mentioned that I believe that 9% of the country was black. And she said, that's ridiculous. Everyone knows blacks are a majority of the country. And I said, well, my information is that it's about 9%. And she said, where did you get that from? <laughs> Triumphantly, I said, from the U.S. Bureau of the Census. And she said, that's the government. <laughs> and uh, not long afterwards, weeks after that, I saw a survey in the Washington Post that showed that a plurality of uh, Blacks thought that black was blacks were a majority and i thought about it a little bit and i figured hey if i were living in a segregated society and most of the people that i dealt with were black i would think that too uh, yeah. that, and and the other thing i would mention when, when honors college was formed i uh, was fortunate enough to teach in the first year of honors college <coughs> And we were talking about World War I and somebody raised their hand and asked uh, about the Turkish troop movements during the war. And I'm thinking, how am I supposed to know that? So I said, you know, I don't know, but I will look it up and get back to you. And a hand goes up. It's, it's a young man named Zoltan Ferenczi. He knew all about the Turkish <laughs> military, Turkish army's movements during the war. And I learned a very good lesson for teaching in the Honors College. If you don't know, don't say you don't know, say, does anybody know that? <laughs> <laughs> and most of the time, somebody did. Uh, I'll pass that along to Graham Harper. <laughs> That's great. Great uh, we lesson do in humility. <laughs> we do have a few questions that are piling up uh, in the Q&A here. Uh, we have Gerald Grossman, who is asking about if someone can reminisce about Jim McKay and math. Does anybody have any fond memories? Uh, Jim, Jim was a neighbor of mine uh, in the uh, faculty subdivision. Uh, we were two houses apart. Uh, and he and his wife were the godparents of our first child uh, in there. Um, Jim was, I, I believe Jim uh, was a charter faculty member coming in 1959. Uh, so he was one of the party pioneers uh, who launched with the first freshman class uh, at the university. Uh, but um, I, I remember him being pretty active also in the unionization movement. Right. Is that right, Bill? Yeah, um, Jim also was the first chair of math. Right, okay. Uh, hmm. it, it sounds like you all were very close. Uh, each of the faculty members that you guys had a very tight-knit community. Is that accurate? 
I think very much so. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I know we, uh, we've got some uh, opportunity to take questions from the audience in the room. So if you have questions and you'd like to write them down on your cards, just a, a quick reminder to please go ahead and do that. Uh, or if you're feeling like you uh, um, want to offer your question, we just need to give you a microphone. Uh, but please let us know if you have a question, we can uh, take those. Um, also, those of you in the room, there is uh, still some uh, coffee and cookies in the back, so don't be shy. Uh, um, but yeah, there's a, there were a couple of other things that I think we saw Kelly online. Did you want to take maybe another one of these here? It looks like maybe Mary Otto came in. Yeah, while we uh, wait we for have, a few to come in from the room okay. here. So uh, Mary Otto is asking, do you believe the dream of OU was realized? What ways do you see the current university fulfilling the promise of a unique learning environment? In what ways is the current university not fulfilling the promise? Um, I, I'll speak up because a number of my classmates also say, well, it's, it's very different than when we were there. And it is. I mean, it's much larger. Um, I think my freshman class was 150. And I don't want to say how many of us actually graduated. But um, uh, but I, th I think the, the, the core principles are still there. Um, I think the emphasis on the academic, uh, the emphasis on interdisciplinary studies, um, all are hallmarks uh, of the university. I think the Asian studies or international studies that's now more broadly defined um, are still um, very important to the institution. What about the original question? Was you know the dream fulfilled? I, personally, I think so. Modified, but yes. I would I would agree with that. I think uh, I, I think the years that have gone by have uh, uh, tested that, and uh, the, uh, the the grades have come out high for Oakland. I've been very impressed with what it's been able to do and what it continues to do. We do make them sophomores now. We do make, <laughs> we do make them sophomores, that's right. Uh, one of the things that we, we had the pleasure of, of you know, speaking to you all last week uh, on a few things, and I know there was some talk about um, students uh, and residence life and living, living on campus. I mean, I think we were, we were estimating that there were about 1,200 students in the uh, 70s, and we've got more than 3,000 now, uh, you know, up to um, this current year. And I'm just curious, what was the culture like in the residence halls? What was uh, the, the vibe like on campus at that, at that time in those early years? I mean, we've talked about it being a very, you know, family-like atmosphere, um, but what was it like to live on campus at that time? I guess that's my question because I was the only one who was a student. Um, uh, you know, I, I spent my first three years in Fitzgerald House and then moved over to Vandenberg to be an RA. Um, it was, you know, um, as, as we said earlier, there's not, there was not much social life. I mean, social life in the dorms was playing cards in the lounge. Uh, and, you got some some of the your fellow alums are nodding in the room here, Bill. Yeah, that was kind of what happened, right? <laughs> <laughs> my my wife and I were head residents, the first head residents in Fitzgerald House. Uh, we had sixty four male students that first year, and I think a little larger number the uh, second year, uh, part way uh, through the first year. Our oldest child was born. Uh, we lived in a one room apartment in Fitzgerald House. And after he fell asleep in a bassinet in the bedroom, we moved him out into the living room when we went in to go to bed. Uh, and we decided at the end of two years for him that it was best that we move out of the dorms because in a male dormitory like that, we weren't sure what his first words would be. Uh, right. <laughs> related to these questions about uh, residence halls, uh, so Gerald Grossman was asking, 
uh, if most of the students were mainly on campus or commuters? Oh, it was heavily commuter. Heavily. Uh, and in fact, at one point uh, when uh, we had 1900 students, I think at one point in the residence halls dropped to 1200. Uh, John DiCarlo was acting president and he wanted to close down the dorms and just be totally commuter. Um, I think that was a not a wise choice on on John's part. Uh, it did not happen, um, and frankly, it's one of the things that surprises me the most about Oakland of today is how vibrant and how large the on-campus population is. I never thought it would get that far. Yeah, there's a lot going on. That's for sure. Yeah, we've got a we've got another audience question that we'll take now, and I just want to encourage everybody that is here in live and in person in the room, please uh, continue to uh, submit some questions, and we just hold your cards up, and we can make sure to come around and get them from you. Um, but we do have one person who is asking about uh, maybe some of the charter faculty, like uh, Gertrude White or Bob Hoops or um, Lauren Pope. Wonder if um, any of you had some comments about uh, any of those early early faculty. Well, uh, Gertrude White was a shining star. Uh, she was in the English department. Uh, she was a little older than, than the rest of us and had a little sense, <laughs> which was in, in short supply. Uh, and she was a great poetry reader. Uh, I remember uh, when we had a, a little college called, they never college called Charter College, she was one of the faculty there and we each took turns giving a lecture to the whole group and she read poetry. <clears throat> and one of the things she read was a little poem called Sally from Our Alley, which I had read as an undergraduate and I thought was one of the silliest things. How did this ever get into a I know, into a literature class. And by the time Gertrude finished reciting it, I was crying. <laughs> <laughs> she was great uh, in every way. And we were very fortunate. Mm -hmm. um, you a couple of other faculty that I remember, uh, Dave Beardsley, whom Don brought with him from Wesleyan, uh, and Bill Hammerly, who was one of the first year faculty, for just sheer brain power, these are two of the smartest people that I have ever run into in my life. So. There's lots of good stories about uh, Bill Hammerly that we hear from alums too. Yeah. yeah. Fred yeah, or yeah. Oh, Bill? I was looking at the question and answers and there was a question there from Gary Shepard about dissolving the connection with MSU and becoming an independent university. Um, Oakland, um, it was an interesting time. It was, uh, we, we, uh, there was an interest in, on John Hanna's part and on Oakland's part for Oakland to uh, become independent from MSU. Um, it was a five to three vote by the Board of Trustees um, and the, uh, it was to spin us off. It was a five to three vote to name Don O'Dowd as a chancellor and then a five to three vote to name him as president of Oakland as an independent institution. So it was a very, very political time. Online about that, Don? What was that? There was a question. Uh, there was a question that came in from uh, Jeff Breeder. Uh, oh, actually, I'm sorry, uh, from uh, Larry Good here in the audience tonight. Talk about the transition from Woody to Don O'Dowd and Don's role in sustaining and growing the university. I don't know, uh, Fred, do you want to take that one? Yeah, I thought maybe Bill would jump in first, but uh, I, um, uh, I was uh, on, the, on the faculty at that time, dean of freshmen, and I learned uh, later that uh, John who came from Wesleyan University with Dave Beardsley, as was noted earlier, um, that Wesleyan had a dean of freshman position there as well. but. Uh, uh, when, when Woody left and, and uh, Don became uh, uh, the head of the campus, the um, uh, interesting thing to me was that for, from the very beginning, John Hanna had set this up 
for us to be able to uh, move toward independence as smoothly as possible. Uh, my colleagues in chemistry at the Dearborn and Flint branch campuses of the University of Michigan had to send purchase orders for chemicals and equipment over to Ann Arbor to have them approved before they could even be submitted. And our relationship with MSU, Michigan State, was such that we acted independently right from the beginning. And I, I think that was the intent. And the intent was uh, when possible uh, and, and feasible, it should occur that uh, Oakland would have its own board of trustees and be separated from Michigan State. And that was one of Don O'Dowd's uh, initial challenges and accomplishments. His work with Cliff Wharton, who was then president of Michigan State, uh, turned out to uh, end up with Oakland's independence from MSU. And, uh, and the rest is history. Yeah, and 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 Cliff Wharton's appointment by the MSU board was also a five to three vote. <laughs> we have some really great questions here uh, in the Q and A. Uh, we have Dr. Uh, Mugel who is asking uh, specifically of uh, Shelley Appleton if you could share your story of meeting President Truman. Um, gee, that that doesn't have anything to do. <laughs> Really with Oakland happened before that. Um, I, just, I didn't know any better. I wrote a letter to President Truman. I was studying uh, US China policy and I uh, was going to the Truman Library. So I wrote a letter asking for an interview and I got back a letter from Rose Conway, his secretary, saying he was very busy and didn't have time to see me. So I wrote back a letter saying, well, I had to be to go to the music, uh, Truman Museum and Library anyway, and I'd stop by and see if uh, there was a cancellation. So uh, then when I got there, uh, no, I didn't. I got back a handwritten letter from Truman saying, if you're going to be in the neighborhood, of course, stop by. <coughs> So uh, I did go there, obviously, I did my research first and uh, was waiting to, to see Mr. Truman. And uh, I was told he had an appointment in Kansas City for noon and it was 1130 and I was very nervous. I thought they'd get me in there for <clears throat> three minutes and get him out of there. Uh, and just then Mrs. Truman came by and she said, young man, are you waiting to see Mr. Truman? And I said, yes, but he's uh, very busy now. I will probably will come back Monday. It was a Friday. She said, you wait here, young man. And I was terrified. I did not want to be <laughs> seeing Truman then because I was going to take me two minutes and they'd get me out of there. Uh, but she came back and said, Mr. Truman, we'll see you now, young man. So I went in there and uh, I was nervous as could be. Uh, and the interview lasted two and a half hours. Uh, I, oh. I repeatedly said, thank you, Mr. President, because that's what you're supposed to say, you know, to end it. But he said, no, I'm not finished. <laughs> <laughs> and I asked stupid questions. And at one point, he said, you're not listening to me, young man. Why don't you ask me how we did foreign policy in our administration? And I said, how did you do foreign policy in your administration? <laughs> and he went on and on and on and told me stuff he shouldn't have. At one point, <laughs> he said, yes. He, he told me that John kai uh had stolen $2 million of uh, US foreign aid funds. And then he said, yes, he did. And I turned around and two guys were in the back were going like that. Uh, he was just exactly uh, what his public image was. I was incredibly lucky. Well, you say that has nothing to do with Oakland, but in, in some ways it really does because 
we were young, we were brash, we challenged everything any place we could. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the questions that we got uh, from in the room here is uh, from Joan Rosen is with us tonight. Talk about the small colleges within the university uh, at the and during those early years and, and what happened to them. I've heard, you know, some of our alums talk about charter college or little college. Um, I'm wondering if, if any of you have anything to um, mention about those. Well, I started charter college uh, and uh, it was certainly good for retention. We had 152 people and uh, freshmen and 150 sophomores. So, uh, and many of them were living in the dormitory. I'm trying to think of the small dorm where they were. Uh, Prial, maybe? Yeah. Well, Annabel? Prial, Annabel, yeah. Well, and any anyway. event, uh, I left for a uh, Fulbright in Taiwan, <clears throat> and these were the years of uh, strong student activism, kind of like now, uh, and that my feeling was that that uh, college got taken over by uh, really radical uh, faculty at that time and, and put an enormous amount of pressure on them, and so I uh, opposed that and got out of it. And, and it just died of its own weight. Mm -hmm. uh, there was also a new college, which was set up uh, basically by Mel Cherno, uh, mm -hmm. and I think did a lot better. I think Dave Bricker is here, and Dave was uh, an important member of that faculty. <coughs> um, <coughs> so those are the two. And then, of course, Honors College, which survives today. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and Little College preceded the Charter College and New College, um, and that was my in my freshman class. Um, we took Western Civ and um, freshman uh, English literature uh, together. Uh, they were team taught, um, and in my case, it was uh, Maury Brown in English and Mel Turnell, um, who I then went on to take you know, two or three other courses from Mel. Uh, Uh, we have a question uh, from the Q&A. Uh, our newest uh, dean of the uh, grad school, uh, Dean Brandy Randall, has asked, can you discuss the formation of the first graduate program at Oakland University? Something that there's not a lot uh, really documented and interesting to hear. We also understand that Dan O'Dowd was uh, heavily involved in making that happen. Yes, um, I, I can comment. I'm sure Fred can comment as well. Engineering was the first uh, graduate program. Um, and Don's feeling was that uh, for us to be, quote unquote, a real university, we needed to have graduate programs. Uh, and engineering, uh, particularly systems engineering, um, PhD was uh, given the auto industry in Detroit. Uh, was the key to that. And so that was our first uh, program. Great. So uh, just out of curiosity, somebody from the audience here in person is wondering when the last time each of you have been back to campus. I know, Bill, you were here a few, uh, a few uh, recent, more recently, but uh, when was that? A couple years ago? Yeah. Yeah. But Shelly and Fred, how long has it been since you've been back? Well, for me, it's been at least 20 years. Uh, um, my younger son, James, for a number of years worked at Michigan State. And when we would come up to East Lansing, we'd occasionally drive over from there to play golf at Oakland or uh, see some friends who were still on the staff there. Uh, but that's he's been uh, he has been in Knoxville, not in East Lansing, for more than ten years, and uh, so it's been fifteen or twenty years since we've we've set foot in Rochester. Haven't been back forever, uh, but I, in connection with that, uh, 
long after uh, Don and Jan O'Dowd had left Oakland, uh, first for Albany, uh, where he headed the uh, New York system, my office was in Jan and Don O'Dowd Hall. Uh, mm -hmm. and one day they returned to campus, uh, and I saw them uh, at the entrance to, the, to Jan and Don O'Dowd Hall, and they asked me, how do I find this room and so forth? So I had the distinction of being the one to uh, advise the O'Dowds where to go, how to get around their hall. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, if, if I were to come back now, uh, I would need a Boy Scout because I, I couldn't find anything. Aaron and I could uh, show you around. Anytime, Shelly, anytime. We'll, oh, yes. We will handle that for you, no mm -hmm. problem. Do you want to take a question online, Shelly? Sure. Um, so going back to the MSU OU, uh, Jeff Brieger is asking, when you guys were originally starting out, what did you think would, have, would develop from MSU OU? Where did you think it was headed? What, what was Woody's vision? Was there? Well, when I was a student, Woody's vision was that we would have 20,000 students. And I thought that was crazy. Um, turns out we wow. have about 20,000 students. <laughs> um, yeah. What did I think it would become? I, I think it's kind of related to the question is, did Oakland live up to its dream in some, in some ways? Uh, and I think the answer is yes. Um, I, I thought it would uh, it would become larger. I thought it would become more comprehensive. Um, I guess one of the things that surprises me is how much growth there has been in terms of sponsored research. Mm, great. Fred, Shelley, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, well, I, I think one of the more interesting recent, fairly recent developments has been of the medical uh, units to Oakland, which were not all contemplated at the, at the beginning, uh, but I, I think add a wonderful to campus and uh, uh, show continued growth and development in a very positive way. Many of my colleagues the first couple of years uh, thought it was going to remain a very small liberal arts college. Uh, I didn't think so because we had 2,000 acres and we were a state university and the, uh, the young population was increasing. So I thought it would grow, but hey, not, not, not to the extent it has now. Well, 20,000 students was pretty much right on the money, <laughs> actually. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, we do have another, we have a ton of questions online. And uh, if we don't get to them during this talk, we'll see what we can do to get some answers out there uh, later from the group. Uh, but the one of the questions that we have on here is from Jeff Kowalki. I apologize if I'm mispronouncing that. Can anyone comment on John Tower from the School of Business Administration? Jeff said that he hired him in 1993. Um, John um, was the classic. Uh, I remember John Tower's name. <laughs> he was a he was a classic uh, utility infielder. He played so many different roles at Oakland. He was an associate dean in the college. Um, he was involved in um, extension work, he was in, I, I, I mean, he had three or four different kinds of roles in addition to his faculty role. In fact, he was the one who taught most of us VisiCalc. If you are old enough to even remember what VisiCalc is. Fred, did you have anything to add to that? No. Yeah. 
Well, we're almost at the end of our hour. So I uh, wanted to take one more question. This one came in from Alice Horning. Um, she said, when she joined the faculty, Bill Hammerly told me that I was, quote, new faculty. And I would always be new faculty because I wasn't charter faculty. And she's wondered if uh, Shelly had any comment on that. <laughs> no, but I, I do have a comment on Alice. Um, hello, Alice. <laughs> Uh, I remember, and you probably do too, uh, uh, when I first uh, got to the University of Minnesota uh, and got off the bus and didn't know where to go, a guy was walking by and I asked him what was the way to the campus. From that sentence, he told me within 10 blocks where I grew up. Uh, and my wife was with me and she said that ah, she would really fool him because she had training as an actress. But no, he did that, too. Uh, he was a member of the linguistics department. So being the nasty person I am, uh, one day at a, a gathering at Meadowbrook Hall, uh, Alice and Brian Copenhaver, then the dean, uh, were they were talking with me and I told Brian that. And he looked at Alice and said, can you do that? And she could. And he really thought nobody would ever know. But she, she could and did. So hooray for Alice. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, Alice. Uh, so we are, as Aaron said, uh, kind of winding down our time. But we do have one more question. Uh, you guys are our OU legends. Uh, here, able to tell us about all of these things and we're so grateful for your time and that you just have these great memories to share but uh we want to know who are OU legends to you i've already said gertrude white dave beardsley bill hammerley mm -hmm. among my colleagues and uh, i'm these are only the ones who sadly have passed away uh, many of my colleagues who are here are pretty super uh, people too but those those are the ones who made the big impression on me. My legend would be, um, would be Donald Dowd, um, who nurtured me as a student, um, who hired me to work for him, and who guided me through much of my career and um, moved me uh, up in the administrative ranks and then to the University of Florida, which has been a great way to cap a career. So Don would be my Fred. Uh, I would say I would agree with Bill with Donna Dowd. Um, there were some people like her, Herb Stoutenberg in the early years. Uh, Lauren Pope's name came up before. Uh, I was pleased that somebody asked a question about uh, Gertrude White. Um, you, you mentioned in introducing me that I left Oakland in 81 to come to the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga, and I learned that Gertrude's husband's alma mater was UTC, uh, and I was able to persuade Bill White, who was a journalism professor at Wayne State University, to be one of our commencement speakers to, uh, at UTC, uh, and made that connection as well. But there were there were certainly some wonderful people, uh, John Hanna, the Wilsons, uh, certainly Matilda. Uh, uh, are, are all instrumental in making this all happen. Uh, and uh, Woody and Paula Varner are at the top of my list as well. Mm -hmm. Dan O'Dowd had also uh, mentioned previously that John Hanna is one of the unsung and not always recognized founders of the university, uh, of course, with uh, the Wilsons. So uh, does anybody have anything to say about uh, John Hanna? He was... Um... Yeah, Don's observation is right on target. Uh, John Hanna was very protective of Oakland. Um, he nurtured us. He uh, kept the folks in East Lansing away from us. Uh, no, he did, literally. And yeah. It, which gave us the latitude to do what we wanted to do. And to lead to independence and right. down the road. To right. yeah. Absolutely. Excellent. Well, we are just about, well, maybe a little bit over time here, uh, but we knew that was going to be the case when we got you guys together. Um, 
you know, we probably could have gone on for a couple more hours um, and continue to learn such great stories from you all. So I wanted to say a big, big thank you to the three of you, to Fred, Bill, and Shelly. Uh, Dan, we wish you all, we wish you were here tonight. Um, and uh, we wanna thank everybody for their participation, uh, those viewing, those here in the room, those uh, via Zoom. Uh, we especially want to extend a big thank you to Bill Canellan. He was definitely uh, the organizer behind the scenes uh, from the panelist side. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just don't know how we could have done it without you. And uh, you, you made it all really come together beautifully. So thank you so much. So um, I hope that uh, you'll all continue to join us for uh, the rest of the homecoming 2021 weekend. Uh, there's more activities going on tomorrow. Uh, any highlights, Erin, that you'd like to? Yeah, actually, we still have, uh, we've got soccer and uh, football club to look forward to. We've got a tailgate tent that uh, OU Student Congress is uh, going to be supporting. So there's definitely some activities still out there. If you want to go to oakland.edu backslash homecoming for more information, you can check that out there. And gentlemen, open invitation. Anytime you want to come back to campus, you let us know. Kelly and I will take you around. <laughs> Thank you. Thank so, you all so much. From the room, let's have a big uh, round of applause for our panelists. Thank, Thank you very you. much. That concludes our program for the evening. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Thanks. Good night.